Hello, everybody. This is the third installment of our uh, conversations about uncertainty. I am privileged today to be joined by Lori Phipps. I'll let him introduce himself and give you a sense of what he does. But we're going to have a bit of a conversation about his project today and how it got there, why he thinks it's important. And we're going to debate some of the issues that he's got around it. And instead of having a conversation about finished products, we're going to have a bit of an uncertain conversation about how uncertainty is working in Lori's life. Hi, Lori. Why don't you give a brief introduction about what you do and uh, how you got here? Uh, okay, so uh, I'm the senior research lead at JISC, which um, in short provides the internet to all of the UK further and higher education sector. Um, but we also do, do a lot of research and development. Uh, I'm looking mostly at research and into learning and teaching, and I'm working with a whole host of institutions uh, where I'm looking at digital behaviors. Very cool. So, uh, Laurie, you and I have been colleagues for a long time now, 15, 16, 17 years now. We've been working together on and off on different projects. Um, but this one is kind of new to both of us, this whole language of uncertainty. How does the word uncertainty work in the work that you're doing? Why is it important to you? Um, I really hate the word because um, <laughs> it just means that I can't plan anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it just drives me nuts, but it kind of helps me to justify doing research that is speculative. Right. You know, it's it's the idea that you know I'm I'm looking at things and I don't know where it's going to take us. Um, and it's great for me because um, from my perspective, I do lots of research around what people are doing and and what their behaviours look like and how things are panning out in universities uh, and colleges. And I sort of come and I say, okay, so these are the patterns that I see emerging. These are the trends that we, here they are. It's uncertain what it means. Um, and at this point, I get to sort of then work with my colleagues in JISC, um, Paul Bailey, who you know. Um, mm -hmm. And we start saying, okay, let's let's sort of refine this down a little bit and and start to sort of make something, some sense from that. So we start with this big uncertain picture about what we're looking at. And we sort of try and then narrow it down. So uh, maybe you're a good person for me to um, to fire this question at because I get it all the time. So if are you just hiding behind not having to measure stuff? Like, seriously, I mean, how many projects have we been involved in or measurement issues we've been involved in where they're like, if it's not measurable, why are we talking about it? I just I was in a meeting earlier today where somebody said, are we really going to put this wishy washy language in there? How are we ever going to measure that? And and today's A level results in my country, all the all the kids get their grades today where they've been measured for their school career that then tells them where they go off onto university. Like mm. we're obsessed with measurement, right? Um, here's an uncertain question then: What if we stop measuring things? What would happen if we stopped measuring things like educational outcomes? Well, we'd have to have a shortcut, right? So at the end of the day, the measurement's a shortcut. So there's a whole bunch of uh, bureaucrats in all of our countries who need to make decisions based on something. So we apply a number to something so that we can decide whether or not people are doing a good job, whether or not it needs more funding, whether or not whatever. So, I mean, what's the alternative? Okay, so I, I don't know what the alternative is, but I think you just hit on one of the big things. People measure things because they apply funding to them. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's the reality in which we live in. Um, but you and I both know that actual money is is a, an artificial construct to mm -hmm. what actually happens in real life. You know, it's it, it's not even an, a good indicator of of uh, of whether or not something is a success. You know, I, we've seen projects funded that have been dreadful. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. true. You know, um, and we've seen fund um, projects that got really very very little money, and they were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, none. or none. Yeah. Um, so the funding is is an interesting one. And some of the projects that we measure the least are the most successful, you know, uh, or the, those projects that even define their own measures of success are the most, sex, you know, the most successful ones that I've seen. So the, the measurement thing is hard. But, you know, in education, we we do have this this metric that we apply to things, you know, all sorts of different ones, and we're obsessed with it. I think apply is an important word to there, because as two old white dudes sitting here in this conversation, um, the apply is very much an issue, because whenever we get to measurements, it's a bunch of 
generally old white people who get yep. a chance to decide what that measurement is and then get to apply it to people. And we look at, certainly in my country, when we look at indigenization, and indigenous ways of knowing, mm -hmm. um, suddenly those measurements don't work in the same way. And we need new ways to value, not new ways, we need to allow for other ways or at least make room for. And again, oh, those are empowered situations. Like I'm deciding I'm making room for. Um, yeah. And, and I guess, me, I guess what, the, the thing that you and I have come to terms with working together is that we are not traditional white guys going through the system. Um, in the, well, no, but even in our background, you know, mm. I failed all the way through my education, right? Too. And I, you know, and I know you had the same experience because people were applying measures that we hated. Um, you know, so I think that we've got some empathy with the measurement thing. I, you yeah. know, I, I failed every exam until I got to university. Um, and I didn't get to university till I was in my mid twenties. And I know that your education experience is not that different to mine. Uh, my first two years of university, I had a 1.45 cumulative GPA. And I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's not good. Bad, I think, is the word for it. Right. I mean, I, and I guess that we are sort of um, maybe a little biased against the measurement, and that's an important thing to talk about too. Mm -hmm. So, I think I think the power conversation is an important one, and it's certainly one of the things that, um, and even in this this series of conversations, there are a number of other voices I've been reaching out to, and the simple fact is is that those voices are um, overtaxed right right now so like there's a series of people who are in this in the uncertainty conversation right now who i have talked to and have invited into to have conversations but there are so few people who have made it through the old white dude barrier that i hate to tax their time to try to bring them in right it's such a struggle and so and it leads it, to, to yeah and it's also not their responsibility to represent everybody of course you know? not so the conversation is left to two perhaps inferior people to have a discussion about it. Um, but given that, and given acknowledging the fact that we come into this from the, the privilege that we do, what is it that you're planning to do over there in the United Kingdom? So I've got a small thing that I'm doing. It's, it's mm -hmm. kind of, it is part of my job, but it, it's kind of something I'm working with our HR team on. We now have a graduate program at JISC. Um, and the person that's running it is brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. We've got a lot of really, really good graduates. Um, and we've got a highly diverse graduate workforce as well now. I, I think that's one of the things that JISC should really sort of be proud of. You mm -hmm. know, this is a really, these are really diverse voices, and I'm really excited about that. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to have an induction for the new grads that are starting this year. And we've got, and we're bringing along the grads that started last year as well. And um, I don't know where I got the name for this, but we're going to call it the Institute for Uncertainty. Um, it may have come out of a conversation I had with an old white dude, yeah, um, but is. yeah, you know this guy, right? So we're gonna we're gonna do something. But we're gonna we, it's it's basically just getting people thinking differently. So these are people that are coming into JISC. They're going to be working across the education sector in the UK. And I want them to start thinking differently from the beginning. So we're going to start the day. We're going to do a series of exercises. The first thing I want to get them doing, and, and you know I've been doing this for years with people like um, Donna Lanklo and Dave White, is I'm going to get people to start thinking about what their own digital practice looks like, yeah. what are the tools that we do. Then I'm going to get them thinking about what research means in the context of what we do and get them doing some very, very quick online research um, during the day um, to get them thinking. Then we're going to move into... Can the, I stop the, you there? Can I stop yeah. you there? Sorry. The research piece and the search piece is something that I really, I, I don't want to let that go because I just wrote, we, we've been talking in the group, we've been, the project we've been working on about the idea of ethical research yeah, and how to teach people to change their research practices so that there's an ethical process involved in it some of that's about not rewarding certain kinds of marketing that comes at you and avoiding clicking on things some of it's about the kinds of words you use for searching and the way that brings up different kinds of results and i'm just i'm wondering what the what your search approach looks like in terms of that, if you've gotten into thinking about that at all so i have started thinking about that what i don't want them to do is just 
you know, use the G word and say, hey, I looked at this and these were the first 10 things that I found. Yeah. Um, what I want people to think about is I want them to start thinking about where the source is coming from, what the agenda is of the source. You know, we're, we're going to get the nice thing about having grads is, is that they are coming at us with hopefully good info lit skills from the beginning. Um, you know, we've got really good grads and and I want them to sort of really evaluate the source of what we're seeing, yep. not just say, oh, AI is going to be big because I saw this AI people that said it was going to be big, mm -hmm. you know, you know, which is sometimes, let's be honest, we see a lot of that in ed tech, you know, we said we see a lot of vendor driven research, right? Crazy. Um, I want I want the grad scheme to start evaluating and and digging beneath that. And we're going to be pushing that um, quite hard. Cool. Um, um, well, so, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. You, that's right. I mean, and that research, getting them to think about the source of that research is it then brings us into looking at trends. What are the trends that are going to impact on? Well, we, we're going to give it a deadline of 2050. And the reason we go in 2050 is it's beyond it's beyond my working lifetime. Yeah, I'll be gone. Yeah, yeah. that's it. I'm out of there. I've got no skin in the game for 2050. And actually, probably um, these graduates might not have either. Well, interesting. So they, because, you know, we know that there's portfolio careers now. Um, yeah. But I'd like them. So I want them to think beyond the horizon of this is impacting my work for the next five years. So we're going to go 2050. We're yep. picking, we're picking a, a series of scenarios and saying, what, are, what, is, what is society going to look like? Yeah. And then once they've built those scenarios, that uncertainty of what society looks like, we're going to say, well, what would an education system look like in those scenarios? Um, and, and, as a, for as a, and for who? Yeah, I want them to think about this not as a as a as a micro UK context. I want them to think about what does it look like on a global level. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the way we're approaching this. We're using um, a sort of future thinking model. It's it's a day to do this, first of all. Yeah. And then they'll be working on a project over the next six months to sort of bring something more fleshed out to, to the table and say, look, this is what we're going to be doing. Um, this is what we think education might look like in 2050. Um, and we've got a few scenarios, and I think it could be fun. Um, they are far future, but also they could be right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking a little bit about this uh, on text earlier, right? So it's like the Jetsons. So yes. if you look at the 1950s when the Jetsons or 60s, whenever the Jetsons, the cartoon, for those of you who are not familiar, I think it's an American cartoon. And in the American cartoon, you end up with, uh, it's a vision of the future where everybody flies around in spaceships and food comes from pills that you like basically rehydrate and it turns into dinners and whatever. Uh, but it was a, an exploration of following the technologies of the time to one logical conclusion, it's not a predictive uh, process. You're not saying the future is going to look like that. You're saying, oh, when you run that trend out, it looks like um, pills get reconstituted into meals. So that's going to change the role of meal making inside of your house. Oh, all of those tools we have now that change the meal making in our house, those do have an impact on how we do things. Yeah, well, maybe. Right. That's the maybe. Oh, so, yeah. here, so here's the thing that I think is missing from the Jetsons. There's no uncertainty. Right. You know, they took what we they took what they could see right now. And they sort of said, do you know what? It's still going to be a nuclear family. Mom, Did dad, two kids. No. Yeah. All the social <laughs> roles were still there. Um, yeah. Not only that, um, it wasn't a case of, oh, we're, we're going to have something completely different to tv they just had a different shape tv yeah. you know the cars the cars still had wheels and a windscreen no nope. so all and of this is things... the this is the warning for futures work right yeah. if your futures work looks like the jetsons yeah then you need to try again yeah. um, you need to dig in a little bit and start asking yourself some question about how the technology actually works have you have you not taken that next step are you not looking at how the social interactions work are you not looking at the implication of essential so again how the change in the way we interact with food changes the way a family works or the the guy the the guy goes off to work every day why would he do that 
Why would he do that? You know, um, it's crazy. Uh, but it's also, but it's also a, a sort of, a, um, is it a parable? I don't know what it is. There's probably a word for this. Um, we it, all failed it, at a school. We've already acknowledged that. Go ahead. It's a metaphor. Is it? Or, or something. For the way that technology companies that we work with behave right now. The, oh. Jets, the Jetsons didn't change anything. Right? Yeah. So at the moment, we are seeing a whole load of people wanting to innovate in practice in education. Yeah. Lots yeah. of innovation. People, we during the pandemic, um, in in my country, we saw the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic attainment or awarding gap close, and it didn't close where it came together. Those minority groups leveled up, and it because we changed. I believe we changed some of the processes that measured attainment. So mm. we changed the exam systems. We changed the assessment systems. Yeah. So we know that innovative practice can have a positive impact, possibly. Yeah, I'm never going to sort of make a, a definite statement on these things. But we know that innovation can. But we're putting more and more educational technology systems in place that are invested in keeping the processes and systems that we have exactly where they are, but just slightly moving them on so that we end up with a flying car, so that we end up with a different shaped TV, and we still end up with you know George Jetson and his wife having dinner together in the evenings, and then she kisses him goodbye and goes off to you know, as he goes off to work the following day. It's a Jetson model. Ed Tech is the Jetsons, and we need to break the Jetson model and do something completely differently. Mm -hmm. I think uncertainty is the way to do that. Accepting that we don't have to have, like, it, it doesn't mean that we don't think hard about these things. It's just that we accept that there are no quite solutions. It's like we go back to wicked problems again, right? Like, yeah. we have challenges that we try to impact and we try to make them better based on a value system that we have rather than a number system that we have right and we value our steps against the values yeah and anyway so yeah so why don't you tell what are the what are the things you're considering doing for um sort of trend circles and i know you're doing it on one day so you don't have a chance to do a full like crazy futures thing where you go and find the trends and analyze them and the rest of it you're going so so normally when we've done scenario planning in the past and you you've been part of this we've done this over several weeks yeah, um, yeah. where people come together and we spend a lot of time we do a lot of creativity exercises and we get people to come up and say these are the big things that we're going to look at um but i'm going to look at um i'm going to look at three things but give a fourth um wild card and the wild card can be the, basically these grads who from even the little that i've seen of the grads at the moment these grads are super smart so they might have a wild card and they might just turn around and say i think we should look at this and yeah. you know I'm going to be steered by that. Um, yeah. But I think the, the elephant in the room that we, we all have to look at is um, what does society look like two degrees warmer in 2050? Um, and if society is two degrees warmer, and that's got lots of implications for all the things, right? What does an education system look like in a society that is coping with two degrees warmer? I mean, you don't, and again, it's, this is a thing with futures work. There's an awful lot of dry rivers out there right now. Yep. It's not like we're looking at a, only a future here. Like this is. Yeah. This starts right now. Yeah. Um, the other, the other one is um, something that I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with. Um, but I think you used the word at some point, cyber borginess, which is positive. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think, and I, I, yeah, I was like, he said what now? And I, I've ch I've changed it to bio augmentation. Uh huh. And I like I'm thinking, Sandra Borges. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and so the bio augmentation thing is is this idea of, you know, so what happens if we can enhance our memory with an implant? Yeah. You know, is that is that good or is that bad? Um, you know, but I'll be, but the thing that I like about this is that it is starting to become real. But I think that is that that is far enough future for us to really sort of unpick a whole load of different things. And one of the things I want the grads to really think about is what does it mean to be human? Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, th those are, there's all sorts of ethics. There's all sorts of, you know, we can bring in all of the AI and the machine learning and all of those sorts of things can come into that conversation. Mm. Yeah, and that gives us a chance to really explore a whole range of things from now until 2050. So well, um, digging into the cyborginess just for a second. Or even uh, the bio-augmentation. Or even the bio-augmentation. Are you looking at it just from the perspective of augmentations that improve our quote unquote learning or the augmentations that we can have as humans and how that might change what we need to do about our learning? I, I want to think of it from the perspective of the wider society. So if cool. I've got, if I've got policemen that can run faster than everybody else, because they've got bio augmentation, you know, or if I've got, you know, um, judges or lawyers that have got access through augmentation to you know a whole range of other resources that you know maybe some lawyers don't there's going to be all sorts of issues around bio augmentations to explore the have so and the have about, nots is a big one think about an insulin um yeah. monitor right where it monitors your insulin and adjusts it in time um right now i've not heard of any case of anybody breaking into one of those um while you're oh. walking down the street but like when you have this bio augmentation possibility so one it changes what it means to be a doctor but also it changes like the way we interact in the world right and there's data privacy there so if suddenly our bioness gets data at some level then there's all these other ethical pieces that evolve itself too and then there's like are we walking around with a data shield around our body that stops people from reading something like i don't know um it, it's it's really there's a whole range of things and again this comes into not not just what does it mean to be human but it then also brings in questions about what does it mean to be private what does it mean to engage in society there's a whole load of things that we can unpick with the bio augmentation one i think it's a really interesting one and it's not about the tech right no well it's 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 about the behavior yeah so it's it's really cool well, this sounds like a lot of fun, uh, Lori. I, ha I have one final question for you. How are you going to measure success of your program? I don't care. <laughs> what do you mean you don't care? Are you going to get it funded? I don't need funding for this. Um, the grads are going to come. It's part of an induction process, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's part of them coming uh, and learning about what's going on with technology, what's going on with all the other things. It's part of them coming and looking at how we do research and how they're going to be part of that on their journey with JISC as they become graduates, as they sorry as part of the graduate program. Um, the 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 one thing that I want them to to take away from the program, and I guess this is the measure of success, is do they start questioning more? Do they start looking more about what's going on and you know, and how JISC, in terms of its role in the education sector, has got a job to serve the needs and um, and, and wants of universities and colleges. That's the key for me. I, it's not about measuring the success. I hope that they come back and we have some really interesting thought pieces around all of these issues. If they all write about it and we get some interesting things, it'd be great. If they come back with some really fleshed out ideas around education in these systems, that will be amazing. Um, but I'm not going to measure that as the success. I just want them to to learn to question and to have conversations like we're having now. How do we make sure, make sure, how do we try to structure these so that the voices of people who don't look like us coming out of these projects so I hope that the last voice that you hear from my project will be that looks like this is me. Um, because I want, I would like now as we go forward with what you're doing and us as part of that wider program, I want my graduates to engage in those conversations with you. You know, I want them to sort of take the lead. My job now in terms of the grads is to start them thinking, give them the tools to start articulating what it is that they've discovered, whether that's on a blog, whether that's in a presentation, a webinar, I don't, I don't care, but giving them the tools to get that information out there. And my job is just to stand back and let it happen. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm there to sort of support them in, in that journey, but I don't want to be the, the voice of this program. I want the voice to be all the voices of 
this really great group of grads that I've got. So can we um, formally schedule a uh, six month from now conversation with those future grads and see how that's going? Do you know what? I'm going to say absolutely yes, even though they haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but one of the things that I'll have to do is put it in their objectives and they're going to be brilliant. Let's make you know, that a I real thing. Then. I, I just know that they're going to be great because, you know, I mean, we saw what happened with your grads. This is the same mm. thing. This is them engaging because what they're doing, it, it feels like an induction. It feels like exercises. It feels like CPD. But what they uncover is actually contributing to what we do at JISC. Mm -hmm. This isn't an exercise or it is an exercise. Maybe it is an exercise. You know, you know, I've got a military background. It's not. We'd call, we'd, we'd call this a live firing exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I want them to discover things that are really going to inform what we need to be doing in the next 50 years. Amazing. Sounds great, Laurie. Thanks so much for your time, my friend. Uh, good luck. Pleasure. I hope to hear back, not from you, but from your students. And, uh, We'll uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate your time listening to the old white dudes uh, discuss the, here. We're doing the, our best. Is that the title for this podcast? Old white dudes, Chad. Yeah, I know. All right. Take care, everybody. See you, everybody.